friend to this chair a lot, so I'm gonna scoot. I tend to like flail around and stuff. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name is Adriel Wallach. I'm the independent game developer. Yay! Um, I'm probably best known as the person who organizes a game jam called Train Jam, which is a game jam that takes place on a train in the United States that goes from Chicago to San Francisco every year. Uh, it's a 52 hour long train ride and we get on there and make a bunch of games and it's great. Um, I also did this thing where I once made a new game, one new game every single week for an entire year, um, which was interesting. And I learned a lot about rapid prototyping and about, you know, creative exhaustion and stuff like that. And that's what I was going to talk about was a lot of lessons from a year of constant prototyping because there's a lot of cool things that I learned from that. Um, but then 8 a.m. this morning when I was really sleepy and waiting for the airplane to leave to come here, I decided instead that I was thinking about Christmas and presents and cool things like that. And so then I changed my entire talk to games as gifts. So, oh, and just as like that, my notes went away. There we go. So games as gifts is my new talk. Sorry if it's a little slapdash because I did put it together since 8 a.m. this morning. Um, hi. This is me and my sisters. Um, this is what it looks like when I get a gift. I'm in the middle, in case you can't tell. I can, eh, that's me. Um, so if the caption of this picture from my dad's Facebook is to be believed, this is Christmas 1993. Um, so I'm six years old and I just got a present. I think this is around the time that we got the original Nintendo system, um, which I believe we only had Super Mario, like the very, very, very first one. And I wasn't really old enough to understand what I was doing or understand it at all because I was six and games were totally new. Um, but I remember, you know, my dad and my sisters playing it and being all like, oh my gosh, you can, you can move around on the screen and jump on things and go, but you can't go left, but you can only go right. But it was really cool. And then my dad would do this thing where he'd like crouch Mario down. You could still jump. We called it a monkey jump because his little hands are on the ground. And that's all I remember of Super Mario from a kid. Um, but it was cool, and it got me really interested in games. Um, and it's one of sort of the many childhood memories that got me interested in games growing up. I like this. Um, so yeah, games sort of became a running theme throughout my life and as gifts. So what I wanted to sort of talk about is games that I've received as gifts, because um, a lot of them sort of affected what I did then as an adult. So this is the first console that I sort of remember getting that was like me and my sisters. You know, it was a joint present for all of us because we were all sort of similar-ish in age. So we all had to share it and play it because back then you only had one console for everybody in this multi-console business we got nowadays. Um, we had this whole like array of games from Super Mario World, which was, everybody knew that, to Uniracers, which like some people sort of know Uniracers, and it was awesome. And then we had this game called Super Pinball Behind the Mask, which was a fantastic pinball game. If you have a Super Nintendo or have access to a Super Nintendo, I highly recommend playing it. It was amazing. Um, but so this was the first console that we had that was ours. You know, the Nintendo was sort of my dad's as like an excuse. You know, he was like, yeah, yeah, it's totally for the kids, but he played it all the time. Um, so this is the first one that was ours. You know, we took it to our room. We all shared the same room, and we'd play all these games for hours and hours and hours. And, you know, and be because of these games, you know, we had a lot of bonding time. And it's one of my sort of favorite childhood memories of me and my siblings was just sitting down, trying to figure out all the really cool secrets in Super Mario World. You know, we discovered the Star World and we're like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing ever. Um, and then we were like convinced there was a million other secrets that never existed. You know, we'd fight each other on Uniracers. We'd try to make the best songs in Mario Paint, um, which were all crap. All the songs were really crap. Um, and we played the crap out of that pinball game. I'm telling you, it's a really good game. Um, so we got that, and I sort of have this like super vivid memory of receiving it. It was Christmas one year, we were at my aunt's, and we got it, and it was in the box, and it was that box there with the Super Mario World included in it, and the fact that like we got it, and we opened it, and there was a game, and we could take it to another room, and plug it into the TV, and just play it right then and there was sort of just like, oh my gosh. Yeah, and it was super cool and just, I don't know why that blew my mind, but it was just, I don't know, something about being able to play it right away was really exciting because I feel like consoles didn't really used to come with a lot of games. Um, and this one had a really cool, awesome game. Um, 
all this bonding and all this cool, you know, childhood memories of the Super Nintendo made me really want my own console because I'm the youngest, so I didn't get to play as much as the older kids because that's what happens when you're the youngest of three is nobody ever gets to play with you. So then the PlayStation 1 came and I asked for this for ages, you know, for whatever holiday was coming up, birthday, Christmas, Easter. Do, do people get... Easter presents? Is that a thing? <laughs> I don't know. Every holiday I asked for this. Finally, one year, I got it. And I knew nothing about the PlayStation. I just knew it was like the cool new console that was coming up. And, you know, this was, this was the gift I wanted because I wanted to play it. I wanted it to be my own, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I had no idea what games were coming out for it. So I didn't even know what to ask for. So my parents just got a bunch of games that the store employees recommended. And luckily, some employee somewhere recommended Final Fantasy IX. Final Whoa. Fantasy IX was awesome. If you've never played it before, it's such a good game. Um, by far the best Final Fantasy game. Um, <laughs> we can fight about this later, but you're wrong. <laughs> unless you've said Final Fantasy IX. Anyway, so, so here it was. You know, I played the crap out of it. I'm, what, 13, 14 years old at this point, um, and I you know, stayed up super late on weekends and I wouldn't do my homework because I wanted to play this game. Because it was the first game where I was like on this grand adventure in this like big fancy world. And you know, I, I'm from super small, small town America, thousand people, one stoplight, nothing in about a two hour radius around there. Like there's deer, that's what we got. <laughs> Um, so it's just, you know, these really interesting characters going through all these really cool developments, dealing with all these really personal, exciting, tragic things, and just this vivid world and all these things. And it was great, and I just I got so immersed in it. And then when it ended, I cried a whole bunch. Because, um, I mean, like, the ending's really happy. I'm not going to spoil it for you. Like, everything's great at the end. The world is fine. Everybody gets together. There's some people who die, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> But I cried a lot, and it was sort of because of that, but mostly it was just because I was just sad, because it was over. Because, you know, I'd spent, at this point, 60, 70 hours with these people who I'd, like, fallen in love with, you know? And they're not, they're not real people, I get that. Um, I understand that they're fictional, but I was really sad, and it was like this whole sense of grief of, of not having these characters in my life anymore. And it was, you know, it was interesting to be crying over, you know, guy with monkey tail, you know, tiny robot kid with hat and stuff. <laughs> Um, but it, it sent me down this really interesting cycle that I'm going to go through. Because then I met like the one other gamer in my middle school, and I was telling him about Final Fantasy IX, and then he suggested to me Chrono Cross. And if I thought I cried a lot at Final Fantasy IX, I cried so much more at Chrono Cross. It was just, oh, I, I could go on forever, but everything I just said about Final Fantasy IX times two Chrono Cross. Um, so it turns out that I discovered that games could make feelings and emotions happen, and a lot of feelings and emotions. And that's when the first time where I was just like, oh, I wish I could make people feel those feelings and emotions through games. And it was the first time where I was really like, I think, think I might want to make games when I grow up, maybe. That's a real job that people do. Um, and I convinced myself for a really long time it wasn't, but that's a whole other story. Um, so emotions, feelings, I started to try and make a game. Me and the guy who recommended Chrono Cross came up with the most brilliant idea of a character, which was a bear. Um, <laughs> it was essentially an Ewok, personality of Vivi. That was it. That's as far as we got in the game design of that character. Um, but more importantly is when I realized, hey, I'm not really good at character design, but I do like the thought of programming and making things. And it sort of sparked this little interest in making games and stuff like that. So I got this really old computer. Um, I don't even think it had a hard drive. I don't know. It, it ran DOS, and I could program in C. Yay! Um, I taught myself C from a programming book that was just randomly lying around. And then I made a little choose-your-own-adventure game that wasn't actually a game. It was just like, hi, adventurer, what's your name? And I'd go, Adriel. And it'd go, hi, Adriel. And I'd go, oh, my god. And then it would go, do you want to go up, down, left, or right? And then I would put a thing, and then it wouldn't do anything. Like, that was, that was as far as I got. But it was technically sort of the first game I made. And it was all due to gifts that I got that were games. Um, and that's sort of my spiel about receiving games as gifts. Now I want to talk about games made specifically as gifts, which is sort of a weird flip side of this that has nothing to do with it. 
Um, but it's a little bit different than what the commercial games are for. Commercial games, eh, let's make a game, let's make some money, let's make people happy. Whereas games made as gift for specific people or maybe a small group of people aren't really meant for the commercial thing. It's just meant for like, hi, I wanna show you something and the only way I can do it is with some sort of interactive medium. Um, wow, I skipped a lot of these. Let me scroll. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. <laughs> so yeah, I like to make gifts for people. This is a really horrifying picture of me and my dad. Um, this is the year I taught myself how to knit. <laughs> this is the year I decided to make my dad a hat for Christmas. And this is the year I discovered that knitting hats is really hard and you should not do that as your second project. Because as you can see, I made a scarf as well, which is much easier. My dad still owns that hat, from what I understand. Um, it's, it's not practical, like you can't see it, but in the back there's just nothing. Um, <laughs> um, but he wanted one with ear flaps, so I made ear flaps, and it's a hat. Um, but the point is, I like making gifts for people, because even though that's the crappiest hat anybody has ever gotten, you know, he loves the hat, I had a really good time making it for him, it's so much more personal, and just, I don't, like, I'm not a cheap person, but buying gifts for people, I just hate it. I'm so bad at it, and I don't like it, and I'd rather just make them something that they like and will make them think of me. Um, maybe that's a bit narcissistic, but whatever. <laughs> um, the point is, I really like making things for people. So, here's my story about making games as gifts for people. <clears throat> First time I ever made a game as a gift for somebody was in 2013. It's not super long ago. Um, it was for one person. Uh, so I'd started dating this new guy in 2013. He was really cool and I liked him. Um, but most importantly is he liked video games, which up until this point in my life, I'd only dated guys who didn't like video games. So I was really excited to like, yeah, cool. And he also made games too. And so I'm just like, yeah, cool. Um, so we'd started dating. His birthday was coming up. We're gonna do cool things, places and go places and have fun together. Um, and then the universe came up and instead he got an organ removed um, for his birthday. So like, happy birthday, you're less an organ. Um, and all the plans of like doing cool things and hanging out and having fun were gone because having an organ removed, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so then what I decided would be a really good idea was just make a game, because I could, why not? You can play that in a hospital bed. Um, so I spent like two days before his birthday making a game and begging an artist friend of mine to make a bunch of little sprites because still not good at art or anything. Um, and I ended up making a game about him getting his gallbladder removed. So he had, to, it's kind of disturbing looking back on it, but he had to cut himself open, um, <laughs> open up the gallbladder, extract some gallstones, and then you use the gallstones to fight Cthulhu so you can release the birthday cake and then you eat the cake and yay, happy birthday. Um, <laughs> so it's not a great game, but it was fun because, you know, it was a little personal thing. It was something I spent time making, something that he then disturbingly got to play in the hospital after <laughs> having an organ removed or, you know, removing his own organ. It's real bad looking back on it, but whatever. You know, it was a silly little game and it was great and I made it. And then it became sort of a tradition. You know, the next year I made a game about me digging through the earth so that I could get to the center of the earth to fight Cthulhu to continue on to get to Australia because I was in, I think, Europe at the time and he was in Australia. So he was, hi, I want to spend your birthday with you, so look at me digging through the earth. And then this past year was actually a game, it was a meta game in a way, because it was a game about him making a game. Um, and then he had to finish the game, and then there's a compiler error, Cthulhu comes out, it's all a mess. Um, there's, there's a little bit of a theme if you haven't caught that, you know. Uh, but, and they're all, none of them are really games in the like, ooh, high score, shooty, shooty, whatever, bangy, bangy, whatever we call games nowadays. Um, but there are these little like personal moments in time that are relevant only for this like discrete moment for this one person. And you know, it feels very personal to do something like that. And you can't, you know, you can do that in other mediums. You can write a poem or make a movie or something, but this is something that you sort of like get to do it like back and forth and play and, you know, I don't know, I always feel like games are like this little like window into people's souls, no matter how generic or how personal they are, you know, there's always like a little bit of you in there and then you get to play with that and that's fun. Um, so that, that's, that's games as gifts. Um, and the next time I sort of made a gift for a person was for a bit of a different audience and it's for my six-year-old niece. 
that's her. That's me and her after a long day at Disney. We're sleepy. Um, so my niece, she is six, almost seven now, and she's the coolest, in my unbiased opinion. Um, she's super cool, and she's funny, and she's goofy, and she's a super nerd, and she loves video games. And so therefore, I get to play lots of video games with her. Um, I introduced her to Octodad when she was like four and a half or five, whenever it was in beta, and it was just, she was in love. Every time I got to visit her, we had to play the, the octopus game. And every time, once she found out that I knew them, you know, she always had these suggestions of, oh, can you text the Octodad people and tell them that there should be rabbits? And, you know, I'd text them, and then they'd go, ha, 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 ha. Um, but anyway, so she loved games. Every time we'd get together, we'd play games. She'd talk about games, Minecraft, obviously, because that's what every child in the entire universe loves now. Um, and last year, right before her birthday, she was telling me all about how she couldn't learn her numbers. She was trying really hard, but she couldn't read numbers, and it was really difficult. She was very frustrated at kindergarten. She couldn't learn her numbers. Um, and about that time was still while I was doing the game a week thing where I was making a new game every week, so I took one of those weeks and I made a game for her. And it was a game about finding numbers, and I put it on her little child-specific Android tablet that they make. <laughs> um, and so it was a game that I got to just put right on her little Android tablet that she played with all the time to watch YouTube videos and Minecraft and stuff. And it was this little touch game where you just you had to find three threes or four fours or five fives. It was a simple little game. It was to help her, you know, have the voice and the seeing and the learning of numbers. And it was really fun to make because it was simple and it was for her. And then I got to add this like cool little personal touch where I got my stepmom to do some voice acting and saying like, woohoo, good job. And it was really cute. What was really cool was when I showed her it and I said, hey, I made you a game. You could see her do this little like, wait, you made the game? And I'm just like, yeah, you know, because she knew I was a game developer, but I don't think six-year-olds really super know what game developers are or really had that connection because it wasn't until like I showed her like, hey, I made this and you can play it now where she was like, oh, you can make games. Like, get it. Um, so she saw that, and it was cool, and then she learned her numbers, which I like to take full credit for. <laughs> um, but more coolerly, more awesomely, whatever, better than that, um, what she started doing was asking me questions about how to make games. And she was like, you know, you can make a game, how do you make a game? And I'd show her Unity projects and stuff like that, which is far too advanced. Um, and then, you know, she'd be like, oh, well, can we make a game together? Blah, blah, blah. You know, she'd start asking all these questions and she started telling, you know, her mom, my sister, like, hey, I want to I wanna make games when I grow up like Aunt Adriel. And he says, whoa. Um, and so then, so then we started, when I would see her and visit her, we'd sit down with Scratch and we'd make a game. And if you don't know what Scratch is, it's like, this visual scripting game making program specifically geared for children with like plug and play programming puzzle pieces and stuff. Um, and we sat down and we made a game, which was pretty cool, which I'm gonna show you all in a second. If you wanna see what a five and a half year old, cause that's how old she was at the time. If you wanna see what they make as a game, I'm gonna show it to you cause it's real cool. So I'm gonna go over here. Uh, Is there sound that comes out of this? Because this sounds super important. <laughs> she did really good voice acting for it, all her own. So this is the world premiere of The Cat Eats the Cake. The cat, or the shark is throwing up in case you're wondering. Neither of the cats have names and you can can walk backwards and forwards, and then when you get the cake, come on, oh no, it was working like two seconds ago. Come on, get the cake. Oh no, this is what happens, all of game development. You go for the live performance in front of everybody. Hold on. Oh. I don't like this job. I want to just get fired. I don't like to eat ghosts. Like there we go. 
in case you couldn't hear what was happening, the cats were yelling, bum, bum, bum. I don't like my job. I want to get fired. <laughs> and then some screeching. Anyway, in conclusion, um, games are a cool medium for a multitude of reasons. There's all the normal reasons of like, yay, escapism, and playing is these cool things, and empathy, and all these things. But they can also be used to do as to show people you love them, or show gifts, or teach them things, or inspire a whole new generation of game developers. And so. It's all thanks to way back in the day when somebody suggested Final Fantasy IX to my parents to buy for me that this masterpiece of the next generation of game developers could exist. So that's sort of my, my conclusion there, is games are awesome, the end. Make them as gifts. Uh, also, that's me. In case you like Twitter or email and stuff and names. Oh, I didn't put my name there. You don't get to have my name. Ha <laughs> ha.